Welcome to the Astronomical League video sessions. My name is John Goss, former president of the Astronomical League. This program is one of a series of presentations we're doing that's in conjunction with the League's 75th anniversary this year. The League was founded on November 15th, 1946, with less than 1,500 members. And today we've grown substantially. We have about uh, a little over 18,000 members spread across the United States, and we have a number of international members as well. Today we have with us Steve um, McCaughey, uh, who is the uh, program administrator of the Multiple Star Observing Program. You're probably all aware that the League is mo probably most well known for its many, many observing programs, well over 70. Uh, this is one of the, the newer ones, which fills a nice spot between our double star program and our multiple star program. Uh, th th this whole, this whole program program is, is a great way to get out under the sky and see what it has to offer with multiple stars. I know you've heard of galaxies and nebula and clusters and so on, but uh, this one's a little bit different in that it focuses on stars that um, or groups of stars that are three or more. So more than doubles, but quite a bit less than, than open clusters. So I'd like to turn things over to Steve right now, um, and he can tell us all about this interesting program and how you can get started in it. Steve, are you ready? Okay. Good. Uh, thank you, John, and it's great to be here. It's a pleasure, and I've really enjoyed putting this program together. Uh, it's been very exciting, a culmination of about two to three years of work with uh, basically three participants, and I'll explain all that as I go. Um, I've got my slide on uh, slideshow thing going here, and I'll just go ahead with my little uh, script here and let you... Uh, ask questions at any time, just raise your hand or whatever it is you need to do. But uh, here we have the uh, Astronomical League has a new program started in September of 2020. It's the Multiple Star Observing Program. In a nutshell, the program involves logging 100 of the 114 objects, either by handmade sketches or by imaging. Here's the web page that you can go to to find all you need to know about the program. And you can see it's uh, www.astroleague.org content multiple stars observing program. There it is. <laughs> and uh, the only prerequisite that the observer needs to have previously completed the Astroleague double star program. And I must note that this is an advanced observing program best suited for experienced observers. This multiple star systems in this program include three or more stars that appear in the, from Earth to be close to one another in the sky. These systems are not considered asterisms. Many may be uh, merely apparent star systems, in which case they are optical multiple stars, meaning that the stars may appear to be close to each other when viewed from the planet Earth as they seem to occupy the same point in the sky, but in reality, one star may be much further away from Earth than the other, and this is not readily apparent unless you can view them from a different angle. In other words, go a light year away and look back and the stars won't be that close together. Go 10 light years away, something like that. Other systems have stars that are actually gravitationally bound to each other, in which case they are physical multiple star systems moving in the same proper motion through space. So you've got stars that are moving along like this. They're, they're, they're all moving in the same direction. Uh, so in some cases, the systems include orbital pairs and their movement along an ellipse can be measured over time. The list includes many physical systems and some that contain orbital pairs. Measur measuring the separation and position angle of the orbital pairs is encouraged, but it's not required, it's optional. Some people like to measure that. The, the, the separation and the position, position angles. I'll get into that in a minute. There are 14 extra systems that are optional and interchangeable with the primary list. Eight of the 114 systems have orbital pairs that can be measured. 
Many of these objects can be observed with, with uh, small telescopes, although some of the components of these systems are greater than magnitude 10, requiring an instrument larger than four inches in diameter. We encourage you to observe the star systems with varying eyepiece configurations, low power, middle power, high power, as some of these multiples are very close and have dim companions that require substantial power to get a clean separation of the stars. Steve, I if have, it is, I have a yeah. question. Yeah. So then uh, for a, a lot of these systems, it would be best that if you uh, observe from a rural location, you want to have some dark skies around you. That is definitely true. You're yeah. going to need a dark yeah. sky. You're going to need optimum seeing and, and transparency. You're going to need good equipment. Okay. It's, it's an advanced program. <laughs> if it's not possible to split a close pair with your equipment, you can designate what outer companions you can see, and you can make an X where you think the very dim companion is based on the literature. Now, on this particular uh, slide, we have HJ 1045 as part of the list. It's in Cassiopeia. There are four visible stars in the system, and this is an example of very close AB separation. And, and this, this is a UMass all-sky uh, photograph, and you can see that it just is a knob, but I, I have split it, and people have split it, and it is possible to split, but it's only 8.9 arc seconds. The problem with this particular one, and you have to be aware of that, is that the B companion is mag 11, whereas the, the uh, A companion, I think is mag five or something. So the glare of the, of the primary is substantial and it actually masks the very dim companion. The C and D companion are, quite a ways away. The C is pretty easy to see that, no pun intended, that's 26.8 arc seconds away from the primary. So that's, that's a, a pretty, uh, pretty wide separation. The C and the D stars are very close. Uh, they're, uh, well, they're 26 arc seconds, but the D companion is mag 12. So this is one of the more difficult systems in the group in, in the on the list and i just wanted to point that out that there's there's some that have very close separations now i'd like to go into a little history for fun some of you know all this already as all of us know the father of modern astronomy galileo galilei who first took spyglass and turned it to the heavens needless to say that began an era of telescopic observations that has evolved over the recent 300 years. Here's a brief history of double and multiple star observing. These astronomers are some of the key contributors in the world of astronomy and double stars in particular. Bernadetto Castelli, a contemporary of Galileo, is credited for the first separating of the pair Mizar in Ursa Major, noticing that the companion changed position over a year's time. Next is the Italian astronomer Giovanni Cassini. And he, um, among other discoveries, discoveries, determined the Cassinian curve, explaining the orbits of planetary objects. Next is the English astronomer John Flamsteed, who created the first comprehensive catalog of nearly 3,000 stars according to their right ascension, and who studied a very complex multiple star, 61 Cygni, bearing his designation, which is still used today. And 61 Cygni is, is studied all the time, over and over again. It's got many, many uh, components. The next is Frederick von Struve, who first cataloged 120,000 stars. He was a busy guy. <laughs> he must have lived with his eyepiece to his eye. <laughs> and a lot, of, let's see, he logged uh and and uh oh no the next is the father of double star astronomy uh william herschel and he logged over 800 physical doubles and multiple stars frederick von struve cataloged 120,000 stars 2200 of them were doubles he was a double star observer many of them are binaries 
His identifiers are notified with the Greek letter Sigma or capital letters STF. His son, Otto von Struve, took over where his father left off, cataloging several thousand double stars. His identifiers are noted with the Greek letters Omicron Sigma or STT in capital letters. 4,300 stars, double stars in the Washington Double Star Catalog are attributed to Frederick, and 996 are attributed to Otto. And that was quite a while ago. The next is Robert Innes. He, was a, he lived in Australia and South Africa, determined stellar mass by way of radio velocity of binary stars. He used binary stars to actually uh, determine stellar mass. Robert Aiken is an American astronomer working at the Lick Observatory in California, discovered 3,100 binary stars, and he published the new general catalog of double stars, which was the basis for the US Naval Observatory's Washington Double Star Catalog. So that's a brief history of up, up to date. The Washington Double Star Catalog, by the way, is the Bible of double stars. Unfortunately, the, the website is down right now, and because of COVID, they've had some problems. And so uh, I suggest you go to another site called Stella Dapi, and I will explain that later, because Stella Dapi is out of uh, Italy, and it basically has all the stars of the double, uh, Washington Double Star Program in it. Okay, uh, next to this slide is the Pleiades Struve 8 in Taurus, it's of course an open cluster, has many multiple stars. And let me see if I can, uh, you can see the primary there. And then you can see these three other stars here, right? Those three other stars are its visual companions. Okay, so I'll go to the next slide. Whoops, I'll go, whoops, gotta clear that, turn that off. And here is, Alcyone close up. This is a UMass all sky cam, all, all sky survey uh, photograph. You notice that the A, the B, and the C, let me see if I can, you can see them without me having to point to them, but here's the B, here's the C, and, th and those are the three stars that you uh, saw on the slide before. It also has E and F and G and H. Now, E and F are pretty dim. You're not going to get those, but G and H are possible to get with a, a small telescope. You can also notice A and AB, and you notice D and DB. Those are spectroscopic binaries that cannot be gotten with any scope from the ground other than spectroscopic imagery, so you don't even try. <laughs> the main stars you're going to get is A, B, C, G, and H, and D. Now, A, B, C, D, G, and H. Okay, so that, that gives you an idea of, that's a really fun, uh, let me make clear that, clear that, okay, good. So that's Alcyon. Now, a Stella Doppi page of the uh, star Alcyon, Struve, 8AB, and it also shows all the identifiers here. And I'll just, just point out, you see the magnitude, you see the separation, you see the PA of A and B, and then you can go on down to all the, also you see E and F are 15 and 13. You're not gonna get those even with a 20 inch, well, you might get them with a 20 inch scope if you're, if you got good conditions, uh, but, uh, the the uh, the e uh, the f and g can can be gotten so I'm not going to dwell on that other than the fact that you can go to this site Stella Dapi and uh, you can plug in the title of the yeah go ahead yeah I have a question and I'm asking this not only for myself but for those uh, we have people of different levels uh, even among advanced astronomers. So uh, I understand some of the headings, uh, but maybe just go through the, the top line, show, name, SAO, coordinates, so forth, and just uh, explain for uh, the folks here what each one means so they can make the best of this website. 
Perfect. This is a really great website. And I'll start by highlighting the name, Stuve 8AB Alcyon. Here is the, w, the Washington star, Double Star Catalog identification number, 03475 plus. And it, you'll also notice that it kind of correlates with its RA and DAC, 03475. It's pretty close, 26. 2406. So it pretty much correlates with the RA and DEC. Now, um, here it shows the companion AB, but below it's going to show you all of the stars in that system. And uh, you can look at each identifier. It, it, it shows the name, the SAO number, the uh, coordinates. All the coordinates are really close because they're all in the same spot. This is the discoverer. And here is Struve 8, discovered it in 1836. It was last observed in 2016. This is a very comprehensive follow-up for all the observations of this system. Um, the PA is 291 on the AB. The separation is 117 arc seconds. The mag on the primary is 2.8, .8, and the magnitude on the, con uh, the secondary is 6.2. So you can go all the way down this list, and you can decide for yourself which ones you even bother trying to observe because it lists them right here. If it's more than about 11th or 12th magnitude, don't even bother. But you got plenty to, to look at, <laughs> plenty to observe. <laughs> so does that answer the question? Can yeah. I go on? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So uh, let me close this and let me go on to the next slide. Here are um, the, the different designates because I've had people ask me, well, Struve 8 is not on my planetarium program. I can't find it. How do I find this object that's on the list? Well, you can go to Stelladapi and you will see all the identifiers, other catalogs and, and designations. You've got the Flamsteed uh, designation. You've got the Bayer designation, the HD. A lot of, a lot of like, I think um, Stellarium has HD. So you can look for, still, like it, SAO is a real common one. HIP Stellarium has, that's one seven seven zero two, And HR, and of course the Flamsteed is 25 Tauri. And the WDS, which is the, uh, Washington Double Star Catalog number is that. So there's lots of identifiers and you just have to search for them. Email me if you can't find one, I can, I can help you go through that. Um, okay, now the next is, okay, let me put this away. The next is Castor, Ca uh, Castor in the uh, in the Gemini. And I, I just want to show this because this is an example of an orbiting pair. Again, you have the, uh, the, uh, the Washington Double Star whoops, catalog. Okay, let me find it. Okay, good. The, the RAN deck, the, the position angle, the separation for AB. So notice it says AB there. So if you go down below, you're gonna see AB. Also, you notice it says this double is physical. Now there's some designations that says this double is uncertain or this double is not physical, but this one happens to be physical. So I'll let me scoot to the next slide. And this is a computer generated uh, orbit or ellipse of this AB pair in, of Castor. And if you'll notice in uh, 20, in, in 2000, it was uh, 3.8. And in 2021, it's 5.4. The, the theta or position angle is 65. And in, in today, it's at 51. Here's the object. And it's going, um, you know, it's going, it's in actually what they call increasing. So in 2022, it'll be even a, a broader, a larger separation, 5.5. So 
That's an example of an orbiting uh, companion that people like to observe. You've probably heard people say, I, I, can, I wanna find the pup in, pup in uh, Canis Major, which is uh, the, a very close orbiting companion to uh, the uh, primary star. And, and right now it's visible. And that is orbiting. Also, Parima is another example of an orbiting binary. So there's lots of orbiting binaries that you can measure. Uh, so that basically gives you that understanding. Now, here is a sample of a log. And you can, this was, I think, lifted from the, the uh, Astro League uh, book, you know, the log book. You can buy that. And, or it's very similar. Uh, what you want to do is get the object name, the catalog number. You can use the number on the list, or you can use the Washington Double Star catalog number. Whatever number you choose, try to be consistent throughout all your logs. Here would be a, a multi. You put the constellation, the RA and deck, and all the way down. The, the magnitude, since it's multiple stars, you might go down here and list your magnitudes, but it's really not critical to list the magnitudes on your log sheet. It's, it, some of them are, you know, like five or six different stars. Uh, your source would be uh, your own planetarium program or the Washington Bell Star program or whatever source you go to. Maybe you use Stellarium, you know. The telescope you use, obviously, the eyepiece you use, your name, the date, the time. Some people like to put universal time. Some people put Julian dates. That's okay. Uh, I don't, I, as long as there's some time in there. Uh, the size of the object is not so relevant here because you have a number of objects with a number of different separations and position angles. You're seeing, of course, whatever scale of seeing you prefer is okay. If you, but be consistent with your seeing and transparency, because if it's five today for you, and then you use a different scale, and that ends up being three, it's very confusing. Um, the, the basic concept of having a log like this is so that pretty much anybody who looks at it can decipher it, can glean the information that you made at your time of observation. And let me close this. This is another type of log. This one I actually made. I added these two ellipses for uh, a low power for the large one, say 110 power eyepiece or 90 power eyepiece. And then uh, the uh, other one would be maybe 125 power. And then this one might be 225 power, where you get, get get a really close view of the primary and its companions. Uh, so there's all sorts of logs out there. People use, but I suggest that you use a relatively large one-page log. It, it's gonna it's gonna cut down trees, <laughs> but it it's gonna be easier for me or or your your own program director to. Uh, you know, observe and decipher and make some sense out of it. Okay, so let's go on to, um, the, I, am, I have done a whole series of annotations that accompany um, the, um, each object on the list. And I sent it to the uh, uh, web host and I'm hoping it's put up soon. Um, it will enable somebody to get a better idea of the object that they're looking at. And th the format is pretty much the same all the way through. You want, you got the, the, uh, the identifier, the SAO number and the Washington double star catalog number. Uh, a, a, an example of to how to slew to that from a, lar a brighter star. Now Thuman is one of the fellows who actually um, who actually um, put this, helped put this program together and he has his own website uh, and he does annotations on his own. And I lifted a various number of annotations from his website that apply to these stars. And this is his 
annotation. You might know of Sissy Haas. Sissy Haas wrote a book called Observing Double Stars with a Small Telescope. And I, uh, I give a quote from her, uh, uh, if, if it's apply applicable, some of them she doesn't quote on. John Nansen is a very, very good double star and multiple star observer who has a WordPress blog called Star Splitters. And you can go to his uh, site, there's a link. So each one of these annotations has quite a bit of information to help you observe the objects. Okay, now just a reminder, each step should be a standalone observation of the star system. The observation includes the object name, date, time, latitude, longitude, power, plural, seeing and transparency, instrument used, label on the drawing and the image of the, uh, or image. If you can label your image, most people that do imaging can label their image. And so that's advised very strongly. Cardinal points are critical on your sketches. Be sure your cardinal points are clearly marked on the outside of your field of view so that the position angles of the stars can be verified. In case some, most cases they're gonna be guesstimated, but it's gonna give, you know, if it's, if the companion is to the Northeast, okay, then you can see that by a, a, a position angle notified. So you measure the position angle from North through east, and this is the way it's always done in double stars. You, if you've done the double star program, you will have done this as well. North being zero, east being 90. And depending if you use a refractor or a reflector, east is gonna be flipped, okay? So uh, you can simply slew to the east and stars coming into the field of view from that direction will be east. Some people like to measure the position angle with an illuminated astrometric eyepiece. This is not required. This is a really fun thing to do if, you, if you're if you used to doing it and you have one of these eyepieces, they're not very expensive. They're illuminated with a battery and uh, there's a turn knob here, the battery goes in here, it illuminates the reticle. And the reticle looks like this. And the, in double star work, you use the lineal diameter, which is here, whoops. That's the lineal diameter. And you use the, uh, uh, the 360 uh, circle on the outside for the position angle. And when you, uh, I'm not gonna get into all the techniques and, dis and discussion of how to use this eyepiece, but if you can't find it on your own, email me and I, we, I can go through it step by step. Why? Because this is required, Yaoi, yeah, a, a formula. The average drift time, okay? You, in order to use this particular eyepiece, you have to um, determine the scale constant, okay? And that is done by running this, this formula. And what you'll do is you'll time a reference star which is usually about halfway up uh, to, to zenith from the horizon. And you time it, and then you run this formula, the scale constant in arc seconds per division is uh, the average drift time of your reference star in seconds times 15.041, uh, which is the sidereal motion of arc seconds per stars, uh, uh, seconds per Earth's rotation, and then the cosine of the declination of the reference star divided by 50, because there's 50, there's 50 uh, uh, linear designations on the scale. So if you want more information about that, I can get that to you. The size of the dot you make on your sketch can help indicate its magnitude in relation to other star systems, labels the stars A, B, C, et cetera, to avoid confusion. And some of the companion stars are a great distance away from the primary and 
may not be in the field of view at higher power. So uh, what you want to do is scan the area with a uh, low power and see if you can find that that one stray companion that may be as much as three arc minutes away or an arc minute away, whereas your other companions may be a few arc seconds away. So there's, there's a, a need to uh, be able to scan at a low power to get that uh, outer companion. And that's it. These are the contributors. Steve Smith lives in, in Colorado. Chris Thuman lives in, in uh, Canada and myself. This is the Astro League uh, web uh, address. And if you have any questions at all, you can contact me, Steve McGee one at gmail.com. And okay. Steve, I have a few comments and questions for you. Yeah, right. let, me, let me get back to the participants. Uh, I don't know. Okay, go ahead. Well, I, um, I think a lot of uh, program administrators may agree with me on this, but there seems to be uh, some reluctance of some observers of taking really good observing logs, taking very good uh, drawing pictures, you know, trying to do the best they can. So some people just resist that. But from my own personal experience, I have found it uh, very, very valuable, very interesting. When later on, like a year, two years, 10 years later, I go back and look at my notes. Yeah. It's kind of like revisiting an old friend or reliving an experience. Um, exactly. You know, I think a lot of us start out observing with, with, with the, the Messier program, and that was for, for me too. And now I like looking back at my notes from the 1980s, you know, 1970s, and it brings me back to that time. But anyway, what I'm trying to get is that the, these notes are, they will be valuable to you later on, whether you realize it or not because it, it brings you back to, to this wonderful time, wonderful experience that, that, that you had looking at this stuff. Yeah, I agree. And, and in the case of the orbiting pairs, uh, you're, you're logging where it is today. And in 20 years, it's gonna be on a different spot. Yeah. So it, well, that, that, you can look back and say, well, this is where it was back then. <laughs> that bring, brings me up with another question is, uh, what's the shortest period of a multiple star or a double star that's in these multiple systems that the shortest period you know of. And in, in this particular on this particular list, yeah. I I would guess maybe a year or two, but not wow. long, not shorter. Maybe most of them are, are five years or 10 years. There's only eight orbital pairs. I have to go back through the list and see. Uh, but um, they're they're pretty far pretty great separation and uh, observable with a, uh, a backyard telescope. Uh, they're not uh, like Parima, which is not on the list, for instance, uh, you can watch it over a few months time. And, uh, uh, but Castor, I think is, it, it moves probably, uh, what, what did it say on that slide? Like uh, five or 10, five or six arc seconds. Here it is. In 20, 2000, it was three arc seconds and 21, so it's two arc seconds uh, in 20 years. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty slow orbit. But the, the great thing about Castor is that anybody can do it. Uh, yeah. You can be in downtown big city someplace and still find Castor. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to be in the, in the dark sky site. That, that's pretty interesting. That's a, it's a yeah. nice store too. Yeah, it's 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 great, and it has two other companions, which are a lot of fun. The uh, A A C uh, is uh, observable, and A D is observable, and so you've got four stars in that system. A lot of people are um, not a lot, but it's sort of neglected the 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 C and D stars. You know, some people don't don't notate them. Mm -hmm. So this will help you become more aware of the complexity of some of these multiple star systems. Well, I have, I have one, one more question. Are any of these systems or any of these stars uh, variable in nature? Yes, but I, I would have to look them up. I, I, I'm pretty sure they are, yeah. Um, 
if if the binary if the companion of course eclipses that primary then it'll vary its magnitude it, if it, but um, I would have to look up uh, to find out it'd be a good project to see if how many of them are variable <laughs> yeah that like to know. Well, I can see you've added one more project to my list of things to do. Uh, I've been <laughs> taking photographs of high proper motion stars for years, decades, and it is interesting. You can see that motion over a period of time. Uh, of course, I don't have as many decades left as I used to, but uh, you and me if, I, if I start today, and I, I, I probably have photographs and sketches, as you say, John, your past observing logs come invaluable. So I, I may have started on this project a couple of decades ago. I can just pick up those observing logs again. Um, yeah, that comes to another point. You, there's no time limit prior to the program. If you've got ob observations that you feel are valid that, that demonstrate the multiple star system, even if you have to go in and label them or something, yeah. that's fine. That's, 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 fine. That's, that's good to know. Let yeah. me ask you about the size of the telescope. Um, as I understand it, the, um, uh, we want to use a larger telescope, but on the web page, I believe it says that the minimum size is 80 uh, millimeters, uh, uh, yeah. which is you know, fairly small. So are you it's saying small. that uh, to get the most out of the program, you really need a larger telescope, but it's possible to do the program with a smaller telescope? I would, I would venture to suggest, uh, I have a, a 127 millimeter refractor, which is almost a five inch, it's a Burgess. Yeah. And I can get them with that. I, there's, there's some that are very, very tight. And yeah. like I said before, if you don't get that one, one tight companion that's all washed out in the airy disc or you know, the glare of the primary, just, just put an X. I, that's okay, you, you know, because there's at least one or two others that are further out that you can observe with a smaller telescope. But uh, it, because this is, is an advanced program, I would say you need somewhat advanced equipment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm not saying so One of the reasons I ask is that uh, I find that the older I get, the larger telescopes are a major task to haul out and take to a dark site. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I, I tend I to use my smaller telescope, some of which stayed in the closet for years, yeah. and dragging them out more. But uh, it's good to hear that um, this will be a program that a lot of astronomers can do, whatever their best telescope might be, as long as it's at least an 80 millimeter, which I think most of our members would have at least that. Yeah. 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 There's, there's also the option of borrowing a scope. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm always grateful that my club spends a lot of money on telescopes that I don't have to spend money on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there, there's equipment available, uh, and there's, you know, there's a lot of there's some issues about remote telescopes and robotic telescopes, and I'm not going to get into that. I, frankly, uh, whatever the Astro League policy is on remote telescopes, I go with if. if someone's yeah. using those, uh, they can make observations with them, but that's fine. But a lot of people have remote scopes at home. They have a, a setup where they can just stay in their living room and operate their scopes. And that's I valid. Think, I think, and I'm, I, I don't believe I'm misspeaking here, but I believe the Astronomical League defines a telescope, that, and I've got one that I can, uh, I'm in Florida, so the humidity in the mosquitoes get kind of thick. And oh, so at a dark side, I'm actually sitting in the car controlling a telescope. And sometimes I'm sitting on the sofa at home. That is not a remote telescope by definition of the astronomical league. Uh -huh. and, uh, there was a lot, and, and I would suggest that you check that out. And John, uh, check that out before the final editing of this. But um, yeah. On, on the web page of, of this program, it does permit remote telescopes. Yeah. 
as long as those logs are clear, you know, you've got yeah. your cardinal points in the right spot. You got the label the A, B, C stars and stuff like that. And all, all your information is filled in, you know, the normal stuff. Follow the directions. <laughs> yeah. And imaging is um, um, permitted as well as sketching, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, Steve, you covered quite a bit today. You showed us, uh, you explained the program very, very well, the ins and outs and what is required uh, with some great examples. Um, so I'm, I'm really hoping that people will view this and you know, put it on their list to, uh, to, to try because it's, uh, it's, it's, there's definitely a need for it. There's definitely, definitely a, a niche for this type of observing. Um, my own instance, I, uh, the, the, the double star list was the first one I ever did. So th this uh, would follow it sometime down the line. As you said, it's not a beginner's program. You gotta have some experience and some equipment and some time and skies and all that too. To, to, to yeah. But anyway, I, I want to, I'm sorry, you have something more to say? Yep. I do answer my emails, so feel free to email me at any time. Uh, I'm not, I'm retired, I'm not that busy. And, you know, I, I'm more than glad to help because some of these are pretty difficult and, and some things, some, sometimes it's confusing. So just go ahead and uh, contact me. And, Okay, everybody, you heard that. He he asked for it. <laughs> Even on the golf course, I'll, I'll answer. Yeah. But uh, I want to thank thank you, Steve, for taking your time yeah. today Bye. over the past few days for putting the, this uh, presentation together to help inform us all about this really interesting brand new program. As you said, it was last October, so it hasn't even been a year yet. Um, but it's something. So just an, another another thing that, that the league does is try to get people out there under the stars and gives them a good reason to do so. And this is one of them. So again, I appreciate you taking your time. And also to our viewers out there on the session today, we have Maynard Pittendre, who's the executive secretary of the Astronomical League, and he is also uh, an observing uh, program administrator, uh, coordinator for. Uh, the outreach program and maybe some other ones I'm not I'm not aware of, but he's he's been involved with a lot of observing himself. Yeah. So anyway, I'd like to conclude that this session. Uh, welcome people to to to, to come back to our next session, which will be uh, actually held in just a it's supposed to be tomorrow, but we'll we'll see how things turn out. And uh, um, anyway, the, as I said, this is at the beginning. This is all in conjunction of the 75th anniversary of the Astronomical League. So I want to thank you all for, 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 for tuning in, and we'll see you later. Aloha. Thank you, John. Thank you, Steve. Thank you.